Good morning, Crossway fam. So good to be with you this morning. I'm Pastor Fish, and I just want to give you three quick reminders as we go into a time of worshiping Jesus together. Number one, would you click the share button? Would you allow us to join you in inviting our friends and family and getting together to worship Jesus this morning? Number two, would you continue to connect with us? How do you do that? Using the website, using the app, filling out your digital connect card. As you fill that out, you let us know what's going on in your life and how we can partner with you and how we can support you through prayer, maybe even through financial help. We'd love to connect with you and see how you guys are doing and be encouraged by seeing what God is doing in your life. Thirdly, let me just say thank you and continue to give generously. I'm saying thank you because this COVID time has been amazing. You are so faithful in giving to the Lord and worshiping Him with your finances. Please keep doing that. In fact, I'm going to invite you to a new way to do that. Here's that new way. We are going to partner throughout the month of November with Sheridan House Family Ministries. Many of you guys know who that ministry is. They bless single moms. They bless kids in a residential program. But what we're going to do is focus on efforts on collecting dry goods, canned goods, and gift cards, and dropping them off here at the ministry hub or there directly at Sheridan House so that we can join them in blessing single moms November 21st in their Thanksgiving Blessings event. So, may make sure that we're clear on that. You're going to go to their website, shfm.org. Go to the Single Moms Ministry page and look at a list of what you can bring. Dry goods, canned goods. And actually, I was talking to their president, and he would love if you guys would focus your attention on gift cards to Target, to Publix, to Walmart, so that they can be most prepared to come alongside those single moms. If certain things are missing from what's donated, they can use those gift cards to make sure every single mom is blessed this Thanksgiving and this holiday season. I know you're going to do an amazing job. I know once again, we're going to be humbled by your generosity. So when you do that, we'll do that and we'll be doing that together. Let's do one other thing together. Let's worship Jesus this morning. Thanks so much for hearing me out. Let's continue to worship God right now.
Girls, how are we doing today? So we're gonna get into our message in just a minute, but I'm so excited, all right, because we've got some big stuff happening next week. As a matter of fact, wherever you are, I want you to say the words next week with me out loud when I count to three. So if you're sitting in your couch, if you're in your bed, if you're in your back patio, let's hear it. On the count of three, we're gonna say the words next week. One, two, three, next week. So next week, November 8th, we are officially regathering in person. So let me just take a minute and remind you what that's going to look like because our schedule is changing. So we're going to have three service options. It starts at 10.30 with our online service. So at 10.30 a.m., we'll continue our online service to those of you who are not yet able to regather in person. But then we've got two in-person gatherings at New Life Baptist Church, one at 5 p.m. and the other at 6.30 p.m. We're going to have Crossway Kids at our 5 p.m. service during our phase one of reopening. So we'll have Crossway Kids from toddler through seven. Second grade. I want to encourage you, if you are someone who doesn't have children in Crossway Kids, if you're able, hey, join us for our 6.30 p.m. service to save some room at the 5 p.m. for those who are going to be taking advantage of our Crossway Kids programs. Now, we're going to encourage us, especially in the first several weeks, to register ahead of time. Now, here's why we're doing that. It helps us be prepared to make sure that we're able to social distance. Your safety is of utmost concern for us. So we want to create a, an environment where you don't have to worry. You can feel comfortable. So register ahead of time. Registration begins Wednesday before the Sunday. So this Wednesday, we'll be able to register. And here's how you're going to do that. You're going to go to crossway.church slash gather. I'll say it again, crossway.church slash gather. You can register there. You can register for your children in our Crossway Kids classes, which is going to be important for our 5 p.m. in particular, because we have limited capacity in our Crossway Kids classroom. So make sure you register this Wednesday when it opens up. And I am so thrilled to be able to see many of you as you come back in person, 5 and 6.30 p.m. at New Life Baptist Church. Well, can't wait to be with you. We're going to be kicking off a brand new teaching series called Undivided. It is going to be a special, special time. Today, though, I have one more guest with us. He's a good friend of mine. His name is Pastor Arthur Connor. He's the pastor of Metropolitan Baptist Church. But more than that, he's a friend of mine. Uh, He and I serve together on the Church United leadership team. We've known each other for several years. He's one of those guys that I go to when I need prayer. And he, likewise with me, we encourage each other. We challenge each other. I have a tremendous amount of respect for him. And I know that the word he's going to bring today is going to bless your life. So lean in, open your heart, open your ears, open your spirit to what God wants to speak to you today through my friend. Pastor Arthur Connor. Welcome Crossway Church. It is a pleasure to be here with you today with the Crossway family and friends. Before we dive into the text this morning, I want to say, man, I I am just so happy to be here. But I also want to give a big shout out to Pastor John and Pastor Fish. Man, I've been doing full-time ministry the last 17 years in South Florida, and I've seen many leaders. And I want to say that you have one of the best leaders in Pastor John and one of the best leaders in Pastor Fish as they love to point people to Jesus. And most of all, they're committed to living a life that will bring glory to God. I hope you enjoy them. I hope you appreciate them because they are the real deal. Like today, you didn't come to hear from me or hear any jokes that I have. You want to hear from God and through his word. So if you have a copy of God's word, whether it's paper or screen, would you journey with me to the gospel of Mark, Mark the second chapter. I wanna share with you a message entitled, Jesus is able. I believe that in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of racial tension, in the midst of political chaos, I believe Jesus is able to do far more above that we can ever ask or think. So if you have your Bible, journey with me to Mark, the second chapter, starting from verse one. At my church, when we find a text, we shout real loud a word. Uh, I don't know what you're doing, if you're watching in your pajamas, or you're watching at home or on your por- porch, but if you found a text, would you shout real loud a word? And look at what God says in his word this morning. <laughs> it says this in verse, verse one of chapter two, it says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had came home and they gathered in large numbers for there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached a word to them. Some men came bringing a paralyzed man carried by four of them since they could not get him to Jesus because of the Lord's crowd. They made an opening in the floor above Jesus by digging through it 
and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. Verse five, when Jesus saw their fate, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Verse six, now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew, knew in his spirit that, they, that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. Would you put your palms up as we ask the Lord to bless our time together? Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for this moment. We thank you that we are created in your image and your likeness. We thank you that we find our identity in you not because of what we have done, but all because of what you have done for us. God, this, this morning, I pray you would hide me behind the cross, that you would preach, and that you would teach, and that I'd be nothing more than a vessel being used for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Listen, I am so excited to be here today to share with you God's word. Man, I love the first verses in this chapter in Mark chapter two. First of all, I love these first verses because they make a big deal about Jesus, a big deal about who he is, a big deal about what he can do, a big deal about what he came to do. And secondly, I love these verses because we see this great display of compassion, of cooperation, of collaboration by these four men who weren't concerned about themselves, but they were concerned about others. In the text, we see that Christ came back to this place called Capernaum and, and so many wanted to see Jesus. And the Bible says there was a great multitude, meaning there was a, a big crowd, uh, anywhere from 50 to 50,000 folks could have been there. But we know it was a lot of folks coming Maybe because they had needs. Maybe some had a, a, a knee. They had a pain in their knee and they, they wanted Christ to deal with their arthritis. Maybe folks had the, the cross eye issue and maybe they wanted Christ to fix their eyes. Maybe some folks had ugly toes and maybe they wanted Christ to deal with their ugly toes or maybe they had issues like cancer or diabetes and they felt like if they could experience Jesus, he could change everything. But in the text, we see these four men, these four men that weren't concerned only about their needs, but they were concerned about the needs of others. If you're a note taker, write this down as the first major point. It's easy to focus on our needs instead of the needs of others. There's a large crowd. <laughs> They're gathering together and many of them are there maybe because they were concerned about their needs. But we know at least four, four men were there because they were concerned about the needs of others. I believe as believers, we should, we should trade our selfishness for, for being more selfless. Yeah, what do you mean? I, I'm saying that we should be less selfish and more, or more selfless. Paul writes in Philippians, the second chapter, and in verse three, he writes uh, to the church in Philippi, and he tells them this very same statement that we should be those who are selfless and not selfish. In Philippians chapter two and verse three says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, we should value others above ourselves. These four men, in this moment, in this passage of scripture, they valued in that moment someone more than themselves. They were concerned about bringing maybe a friend, maybe a relative, maybe it's an associate, maybe it's a neighbor, bringing him to experience the Jesus that changes everything. And here's why they wanted to bring him to experience Jesus, because they believe that Jesus was able. 
They believe that Jesus was able. You see, they went the extra mile to bring someone to see Jesus, to, to bring someone of great need to experience Jesus. Let me stop for a moment and ask you a question. Are you, are you going the extra mile to bring someone to Jesus? Are you, are you pursuing someone, a, a friend, a relative, an associate, a neighbor? Are you going the extra mile to bring someone to Jesus? Do you have one person that you're praying for, that you're calling out their name, that you're saying, God, would you, would you help bring John to know you as Lord and Savior? God, would you help William to come to know you? Would you help Jamie or Janice? Is there one person in your life that you're praying for that they would get a chance to experience the Jesus that changes everything? Are you praying for someone? Are you pursuing? Is there someone in your life that you're pursuing, pursuing so that they could have a chance to experience Jesus? Are you persuading anyone, anyone to go after Jesus? I, I feel that if we're a part of the family of God, we should live our lives on mission. We should, yes, worship, point our lives to Jesus. We should be in community where we can point each other to Jesus, but we should be on mission where we can point the world to Jesus. And I believe these individuals were on mission to bring their friend who was broken to experience the hope that is only found in, in Jesus. <laughs> Write this down as the next point in the text. I believe because we're on mission, we should bring the hurting to Jesus. I believe we see it in the text. They were bringing this man who was hurting to Jesus. Go back to verse two one more time. Look at what it says in verse two, the second chapter. It says, they gathered in such a large number that there was no room left outside, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. You see, we should bring the hurting to Jesus because they need to hear his word. Look how erratic this is. The word was preaching the word. What do you mean, Pastor Arthur? In John chapter one, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And later on in verse 14, it says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And here we have Jesus, the word incarnate. Jesus is preaching the word to the people and we need to bring our hurting friends, relatives, associates, and neighbors to Jesus because they need to hear his word. We live in a country where folks aren't hearing his word too much. We live in a world where folks are saying, where's the love? People killing, people dying. We need to practice what we preach. And I know that's black eyed peas, but here's what Jesus said. In John 13, Jesus said this, the world will know that you're my disciples by the love you display by the way you love one another. The world needs to hear that message that God wants us to love one another, that when we are not loving each other, the world has to look elsewhere to see Jesus. He says, they'll know you're my disciples when you love each other. First John four and seven says, beloved, let us love one another for God is love. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. Not only is there a call to love and his message is one of love, it's also one of unity. In John 17, Jesus says, to, to, says as he prayed this prayer, he says that they would become one, like me and my father are one. Not, not uniformity, meaning we all look the same, we all dress the same, we have the same melatonin, we look the same, we have the same hairstyle. No, he's saying that we should become one, we should be unified. Because when we are unified, the word says it is good and pleasant when brothers can dwell together in unity. They need to hear his word that says that who the son sets free is free indeed. Some of you who are believers need to hear his word. That Romans 8 and 1 tells us that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We should bring hurting people to Jesus because they need his teachings. They also need his healing. The word, the word says that these friends brought their friend to see Jesus. And look at what it says. Look at how, how Christ is, is just, just, just excited about the faith of these four men. Look at verse four. Since they could not get him 
uh, get him to Jesus because of the crowd. Now, let me stop it for a moment. The crowd was in the way, and, and they could have said, man, we brought him all the way here. We tried our best. We're going back home. We, we, we tried hard, and, and it didn't work. We're going to go back home and play Xbox. We're going to go back home and watch Netflix. We're going to go back home and like something on Twitter or Instagram. They could have had an excuse not to keep pursuing or be persistent because the crowd was in their way. There was a multitude that was standing in their way, and, and they didn't allow that to stop them from bringing their friend to Jesus. How do you know that? Because it's, the text says, even though there's a great crowd that was there, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. But what did they do? They went to another level to lower that, that man on the mat so that he could experience Jesus. I believe in my heart, they, they wanted him to experience healing. See, they had great faith. And Jesus said, because of their faith, this man is going to experience healing, healing for his soul. Jesus dealt with a, a bigger issue than the issue of him having palsy. But the reality is we have folks in our family that are relatives, that are associates, that are neighbors, that are broken, and they need healing. <laughs> that they need healing for their past. They need healing for their guilt. And they need healing for their shame. And I believe Jesus is able to heal our brokenness, to, to bring healing for our past. He's able to take away our guilt and our shame. But look at the text. In verse five, it says, when Jesus saw their fate, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Man, I, I want you to stop there for a moment and understand that, 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 yeah, we need to experience the forgiveness that only Christ can bring. Only Christ can justify us, meaning uh, set us free from the penalty of sin. Only Christ can sanctify us. What does that mean? Only Christ can save us from the power of sin. Uh, write this down as the next point if you're a note taker. <laughs> we should see Jesus for who he is. We should see Jesus for who he is. There's some folks who see Jesus for a man, and he's not just a man. There's someone, some folks who see Jesus not for God, but a God, small g, but he's more than a God. The, re the reality is when folks see the real Jesus, they can experience forgiveness. The real Jesus forgives sin. Where do you see that? In the text. He says to the man, look at, look at it again. When Jesus saw their fate, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. The real Jesus can forgive sin. The real Jesus came to forgive our sins. How do we know that? Because Jesus made that statement, that proclamation, that he said to the brother, your sins are forgiven. Now, there's something else that shows you who Jesus is in the text. Look at verse, verse six. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sin but God? What a great question. Who can forgive sin but God? Here's the answer. Nobody. <laughs> no one can forgive sin but God. And Jesus is saying to this man, your sins are forgiven. So hold on. If, if he is saying to this man, your sins are forgiven, is if he is trying to forgive this man's sin, what is Jesus saying about himself? <laughs> I think if you put the dots together, if only God can forgive sin and Jesus is trying to forgive sin, we're not trying, is forgiven sin, then what do you think Jesus is? <laughs> the real Jesus is God. He is the, the God that became flesh and dwelt around us. I think there's something else in the text that shows us he's God. <laughs> Look at verse seven. Why does this fellow talk like that? They said, he's blaspheming. Go, go down to verse eight. Immediately, right away, like, like they were thinking in their mind that he is blaspheming. Uh, he, they didn't post it on Instagram or, or, or Twitter. They didn't post it on Facebook. They were thinking in their mind that, that this guy is crazy. He is going cuckoo for Cocoa Pops. They were thinking in their mind. They didn't say anything. Jesus didn't, just didn't overhear them saying it. They were thinking in their mind. And here's what Jesus did immediately, right away. Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Wow. Jesus is God. 
He knows what's going on in our minds. He knows what's going on in our hearts. He is the word that became flesh. The real Jesus is God. And not only that, the real Jesus can heal. You see, your faith in Jesus can change the way you live. Your, your faith in Jesus can change the life of others. These men had faith in Jesus. And Jesus made it clear that he's more than just a man. That he's one who can forgive sin. And the question is, who can forgive sin but God? I think the answer is nobody. So write this down if you're a note taker. Two things. One, Jesus is God and Jesus is the son of man. Jesus is God and Jesus is the son of man. Uh, so often when we hear Jesus is the son of man, you're thinking like, what does that mean? Oh, well, I, I think it means that he is God made manifest in human form. That's what Jesus is God. Jesus is the son of man means. It points to him being God made manifest in human form. Jesus is God's son in that he was conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit. Luke uh, chapter one and verse 35 declares, the angels answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the most high will overshadow you so that the Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. That, that statement that Jesus makes later on in the text points to him being God. Jesus makes that statement. Look at what he says. He says, which is easier? <laughs> which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take up your mat and walk? I believe they're both difficult. I believe they're, they're, they're both tasks that only Jesus can do. So here's the next point. We should glorify Jesus for what he does. We should glorify Jesus for what he does. What does he do? <laughs> Jesus saves us from sin. He saves us from the penalty of sin. He saves us from the power of sin. And one day, he'll save us from the presence of sin. I believe that in this text, we see that he is the only one that can deliver us from the penalty of sin. It's a big church where we use. It's called justification. He's the only one that can justify us, a legal term. He can pay the penalty of our sin. He, he is the one who came to live the life we should have lived. And then he died the death we should have died. But then he overcame sin and death. He, he wrote a check on the cross and the check cleared when the stone was rolled away on the third day. He, he's the only one that can deliver us from the power of sin. It's called sanctification. He is setting us apart. He is saving us from the power of sin. As a believer, no matter how radically redeemed you are, you're still human. But the good news is Jesus is saving you from the power of sin. Here's the good news. He's the only one that can promise us a future away from the presence of sin. He is the only one that can save us one day from the very presence of sin. It's called glorification. That one day he will save us from the presence of sin. We got to glorify Jesus because he saves us from the power and from the penalty. And one day he will save us from the very presence of sin. But I also believe that Jesus can heal diseases. Why do you say that? We see in the text, he heals, he not only forgives sin, but he heals this man's disease called palsy. You'll see it in a moment, but I want to go to Psalm 103, Psalm 103, 103rd Psalm. It says to bless the Lord and to not forget his benefits. And then verse three says to us that he's able to forgive sins and he's able to heal diseases. It's parallel. It points to what Jesus is saying in this moment, that Jesus is able to forgive sin and he's able to heal diseases. Look, look at verse, look at how the story ends. Look at, look at verse 10 one more time. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Listen, only God can forgive sins. And he's making it, making it clear over and over again that he has the power to forgive our sins. And so he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. And look at what happens in verse 12. He got up. He took his mat and walked out in full view of all of them. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like 
this. Listen, Jesus is able to forgive your sins. I don't care what you've done in the past. I don't care what you're doing right now. Jesus is able to forgive your sins. He is able and he has paid the penalty of our sins. He is able to to help you be set free from the power of sin. He's able to one day set us free from the presence of sin. And I believe Jesus is able to heal every disease. He doesn't always do it. I don't think we can rub him like a genie in a bottle and he'll, he'll have us be healed. I think, I think God can do what he wants. You know, I have a sister-in-law. She's 24 years old and she has palsy. And man, I so wish that God would one day heal her and she'd be able to walk. But maybe God would never heal her from that disease called palsy. But God can still use her and God is using her for his glory. No matter what you're going through, no, no matter your brokenness, no matter the pain or the agony you have in your life, God is able to use you for his glory. Here's the last point. When people experience Jesus, it changes everything. <laughs> Let me say that one more time so you can write that down with your mascara if you don't have a pen. When people experience Jesus, it changes everything. Now, I'm a sports fan, and so often when we, when we think about our faith, when we think about Jesus, for me, sometimes I think about it in sports language. Like, like we think that Jesus is the leader of the church, and so he's a quarterback, right? Because the quarterbacks, the leader, they get paid more than everyone else. Uh, they get all the credit and sometimes all the blame, and so Jesus is the, the quarterback. Some of you might think that, that Pastor John is a wide receiver, even though I heard he can't catch very well, uh, that he is the wide receiver. Maybe Pastor Fish is a running back. Maybe you might think... I'm good enough to be uh, a blocker on be on the line with Jesus. But the reality is, if we understand the gospel, um, we're not wide receivers. We're not running backs. We're not even on the line. Uh, we may be in a stance at best. Jesus is the quarterback. Jesus is the lineman. Jesus is the wide receiver. Jesus is the running back. And, and against the enemy, it's not a close thing. He's beating down the enemy. He's giving us victory over sin and death. And some of you are saying, well, well, yes, I was in the stands and I, I'm cheering Jesus on. I'm saying, go, Jesus, go, Jesus, go. You have your pom-poms in your hand and you're eating popcorn and you're cheering Jesus on. And the reality is you might be in the stands, but you're not cheering Jesus on. While he is fighting this battle, <laughs> we're, we're dead. We're just in the stands, dead. Some of you are saying, you better give me scripture and verse. Yeah, we're going to close with Ephesians chapter 2. Look at what Paul says in this text. He says, as for you, he's talking about us who are believers, you were dead in your trespass and sin, in which you used to live when you were followers of the ways of this world and the rulers of this kingdom, the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature desiring, deserving wrath. But look at verse four. But because of his great love for us, God who was rich in mercy made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace we have been saved. Listen, Jesus is the quarterback. He's playing all over the field. He has won the victory for us because Jesus is able. Because he is able, he can forgive your sins. Because he's able, he can heal your brokenness. Because he is able, he can make those who are dead alive and allow us to be a part of the family of God. You're a part of the family of God because his grace has saved us, has saved you, has redeemed us. And so I want to say Jesus is able to save us from the penalty of our sins. Jesus is able to save us from the power of sin. And Jesus is able to promise us that one day we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Jesus is able to heal every disease and our brokenness. Jesus is able to change everything. Before you leave, before you go to the restaurant or maybe just eat your, your, the food that's in front of you, your sermon snacks, I want to give you just one big challenge for this week. 
Uh, I want to challenge you, like these four men, find out who's your one. Who is your one? Who, who is that one person you're going to be praying for that they would experience Jesus? Who is that one that you're pursuing that they may have an opportunity to experience the Christ who changes everything? Or who is the one that maybe you're inviting to a church service, to a small group, to a Zoom call, not sure what you guys are doing here at Crossway, but who is your one? Who is that one person that you're going to go after, that you're going to pray for, that you're going to persuade and pursue to come and experience a Jesus who is able to do far more above you can ever ask or think, the Jesus who is able to change everything. Crossway friends and family, it has been my pleasure to be here with you this morning. If you don't know who Christ is, I think you can go ahead and email the Crossway Family Church and, and they'll help you to walk, take steps towards coming to know Christ as Lord and Savior. Crossway family, I want to challenge you to find that one person you're praying for, you're pursuing, that you're inviting to experience the Jesus who is able. Love you. Take care and God bless. Peace.
Amen, amen. Well, guys, we're so glad that you're here with us today and you joined us for our worship service. Thank you to Pastor Arthur for that beautiful, powerful message. Uh, I want to give a blessing over you before you go, but before I do that, can I just remind you, registration for our service begins this Wednesday. Don't forget crossway.church slash gather for all the information so that you can join us next Sunday at our 5 or 6.30 p.m. service. And if you're unable to meet in person, remember that we will continue to have an online service at 10.30 a.m. We love you guys. Let me speak this blessing over you. Now, as you go, Crossway, as you go, uh, go and live your life for the glory of God the Father, resting in the grace of His Son, Jesus, strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. You are a city on a hill and a light to South Florida. Go and be